Here's our next example of circular motion and Newton's second law. Here we have a car driving around a uh, curved road. The radius is still 75 meters. The car still has a mass of 1,000 kilograms. But in this case, the road is banked at an angle of 10 degrees. And to make things very interesting, there's no friction between the tires and the road. Technically speaking, if there's no friction, then the tires would spin, the car wouldn't go anywhere. So ignore that part of the, the, the problem because we just want to do it as an example. Now obviously, if the car was not moving at all, the car would simply slide down to the, to the inside of the curve right here. If the car was moving too fast, the car of course would be sliding up the incline and fall off on the side there. So the car has to be going just right, so we're not really looking for the maximum velocity, we're looking for the correct velocity. There's only one velocity uh, that exists that will this car from sliding inward or from sliding outward. And so what is that velocity? Okay, not a very realistic uh, situation, but it's a good exercise for a physics problem. So let's try to figure it out. First of all, we have the weight acting straight down. This is the mg. Oh, there we go, mg. And then, of course, we have the, uh, since it's on an incline, we have the perpendicular component and we have the parallel component. So here's the parallel component. This is mg times the cosine of theta, and there's the mg times the sine of theta. And of course, it's the mg sine theta that would cause the car to slide down. The mg cosine theta pushes the car into the road, and of course the road pushes back, Newton's third law. So Newton's um, third law says there's an opposite force n, which is equal to the mg cosine theta. It's the normal force of the surface pushing back. Now normally that's the component that would then cause friction to exist, but since coefficient of friction is zero, there's no friction at all here. Secondly, we can say there's a fictitious force called the centrifugal force that will push a car to the outside because of its circular motion. So we can say there's a force in this direction, which is called F sub C, put it in parentheses, it's not a real force, and of course that's equal to mv squared over r. But that's pushing directly horizontally outward. So since we're on incline, we also have to draw the parallel uh, component and the perpendicular component of the centrifugal force. So this is the uh, mv squared over r times the cosine of theta. And there's the mv squared over r times the sine of theta. Now, notice that the actual forces are eliminated by drawing the components. These two forces will cancel each other out. Actually, since we have an mv squared r cosine theta pushing down, we have to have additional normal force like that. So there would be plus the mv squared over r times the cosine of theta. Now we don't really worry about that in this problem, but just so that you realize that if, that because of the centrifugal force, there's additional push of the car against the road, there will be a bigger normal force pushing back. So in the case that we have friction there, we do have to take that into account. But what you're realizing now, or at least should realize, is that there's only two forces here, or two components of forces, that are controlling the fate of the car. It's the mg sine theta pushing the car down, and the mv square r sine theta. Oh, oh, let me see. Yes, sine theta trying to push the car back up. I was just thinking about that. Something is wrong here, something is wrong. Notice that this angle right here is theta, same as this angle right here. And so this component is not the sine theta, this component is actually the cosine theta. I'm glad I caught that. So we have to be careful here. This here is the mv squared over r times the cosine of theta, and this is the mv squared times the sine of theta, and so this here would also be sine of theta. So it's a little deceiving because we always think that the parallel component is always a sine of theta, but in this case, since the force was sideways instead of downward, we have to use the cosine and the sine instead of the sine and the cosine. Okay, now that we've corrected that little problem, now realizing again that these two forces control what's going to happen to the car. If this is bigger than this, the car will slide down. If this is bigger than this, the car will slide up. Of course, this is controlled by the velocity of the car. So if we set them equal to each other, and then we solve for v, we get the exact velocity that keeps the car from either sliding down or sliding up the incline. So let's set those two, two, let's set those two forces equal to each other. So we're going to set the mg sine theta 
equal to the mv squared over r times the cosine of theta. And we're going to solve that for v. Now notice the mass cancels out. We can put the r over here and the cosine down here. So we have r g times the sine of theta divided by the cosine of theta is equal to v squared. I can now turn the equation around. And the sine divided by cosine is the tangent. So I can write that v squared is equal to r g times the tangent of theta. And finally, I can take the square root of both sides. So let's do that over here. So v is equal to the square root of r g times the tangent of theta. Now all we have to do is plug in the numbers and see what we get. How fast should this car be driving to stay on that road? Assume it's a very icy road. So the radius, 75 meters. Acceleration of the gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. And then the tangent of 10 degrees. Let's see what we get here. Hmm. It's kind of interesting. So imagine you're driving on a road, it's really icy, and you're going around a bank curve. How fast should you be going if you ever are inclined to do that kind of driving? 75 times 9.8 times the tangent of 10 degrees equals 13, oh, wait a minute, 130 meters per second? I have to do that again. That doesn't seem right. Maybe it is. Okay, 75 times 9.8 times the tangent of 10 degrees equals, take the square root. Oh, I hadn't taken the square root yet. So I was beginning to worry. That seemed like an awful big number. 11.4 meters per second. So 11.4 meters per second. Hmm, that sounds like about the speed of the fastest sprinters in the world. And they can run about... 23, 24 miles per hour. So, comparing that, the car should then gently drive about 23, 24 miles per hour around that icy curve so that the car will not slide up or slide down. And that's how you do that problem.